Lion Air Museum welcomes you to today's broadcast of the 75th commemoration of World War II ending. Hello everyone and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us virtually wherever you are around the world. It's good to have you in our company. It is my pleasure to announce today's speaker. You may have met him during the 75th commemoration of D-Day and I'm proud to welcome him back today. Please welcome senior docent, Mr. David Malmed. World War II created a world of chaos between the years 1939 and 1945. To this day, it remains the most geographically widespread military engagement the world has ever seen. Although the fighting reached across parts of the globe, most countries involved shared a united effort, an effort aimed at ending the aggression and the actions of the Axis powers of Germany, Italy, and Japan. The battles of World War II can be categorized into major areas of engagement. The Battle of the Atlantic, that of the European theater, primarily Western Europe, Eastern Europe, the Mediterranean, North Africa, and the Pacific theater. The Pacific theater can be further divided into China, Southeast Asia, the Central Pacific, the Southwest Pacific. The efforts of that day and that period in time led to losses that the world has not seen since and hope never will. Nearly 80 million people died, civilian and military alike. The war ended in Europe on May 8, 1945, when the forces of the Allied powers defeated the efforts of Germany. Officially, the war began on September 1, 1939, when forces of Germany crossed the border into Poland. But we have to reflect back to the earlier decade of the 1930s the aggression of Japan and portions of Western and Central China, the movements of Germany in portions of Eastern Europe. Each one of those events, even though undeclared, nevertheless became part of what became a global event. Between 1939 and 1945, the world was at war. However, an ability to vanquish, to defeat, to overcome the aggression of those powers occurred first in Europe on May 8, 1945, when the powers of the United States were able to defeat Germany. The numbers that were experienced during the war included some 17 million Americans who served in defense-related jobs, some 16 and a half million who served in uniform. Of that 16 and a half, some 400,000 died in the service of their country. Another 72,000 were lost, never to be located to this day. The United States, as a production entity, was capable of producing some 300,000 aircraft during that five-year period. Some 14,000 were lost, either domestically in training or overseas. On May 8, 1945, the world was able to feel a moment of peace when German forces surrendered. The United States was able to breathe a sigh of relief. Though fighting still continued in portions of Europe, the Soviet Union did not officially end the Second World War until May 9th when they defeated resistance by German forces.
But Europe alone was not the only area of the fighting and conflict. The Pacific theater, largely defended by the U.S. and its allies, had been engaged in a fight that started on the 7th of December when Japanese forces attacked the United States at its base at Pearl Harbor in the Hawaii Islands. On November 26th, a Japanese fleet sailed from Tokyo to some 265 miles north of the Hawaiian Islands, launching some 353 aircraft on the morning of December 7th. Those aircraft attacked the Hawaiian Islands in two waves beginning at 7.58 a.m. in the morning. The losses suffered by American forces that day became a historic landmark and a need to avenge the attack on a Sunday. It was supposed to be a quiet Sunday. Over 3,500 casualties were suffered, including more than 1,700 who died as members of the crew of the USS Arizona, which is still there today as a memorial to that event. Some 188 aircraft were destroyed either on the ground or in the air. The U.S. fleet was at anchor and the hopes of the Japanese leadership was to destroy the fleet to prevent it posing a threat to the Japanese efforts in the Pacific. Two of the most significant aircraft, significant ships of the day were the USS Lexington and the USS Enterprise aircraft carriers, both out on patrol. The aircraft that the Japanese used during the attack were represented by the, perhaps the most well-known Japanese fighter of the day, the A6M-0. And the torpedo bomber used among the group was known as the B5N2 Kate. Both aircraft participated in that attack. But in spite of the fact that the ships were damaged or destroyed, the U.S. fleet experienced a rebirth, a rising from the ashes like the Phoenix. What the Japanese could not have foreseen is that by the ships being at harbor, they did not sink. They settled in the bottom of the harbor, allowing them to be refloated, repaired, rearmed, refueled, and to return to vanquish the enemy. In addition to the attacks on Pearl Harbor, other U.S. bases in the Pacific were equally attacked at Luzon in the Philippines, at Wake Island, at Midway Island. Though the damage was not nearly as severe, it was nevertheless an area that needed to be repulsed. The damage inflicted on the fleet, while significant, was repairable. The most well-known vessel of the day was the USS Arizona. However, the recovery cannot be minimized. Of the ships that were lost, the USS Arizona, 1177 crew, the USS Utah, while considered a battleship, in fact had been converted to a training vessel. The USS Oklahoma damaged, refloated, but unfortunately was lost while it was being towed back to the United States for repair. However, six remaining battleships were in fact repaired and returned to service. The Pennsylvania, the Tennessee, the Maryland, the Nevada, 
the California, the West Virginia, cruisers, the Honolulu, the Helena, the Raleigh, destroyers, the shore, the Quezon. Each one of those defended the reputation of the United States Navy and the United States military by returning to service and returning to assist in battles both against the Japanese and uh, Axis forces in Europe. But the mistakes made that day by the Japanese cannot be minimized. Admiral Nimitz, on an inspection of the harbor after the attack, commented that the Japanese made three critical mistakes. One, they attacked on a Sunday. This created a situation, one, that was going to have to be resolved by American forces. The resolution was to attack and defeat the enemy. The fact that there were fewer people on duty at that day, the hitting and the attack against the ships, while causing the loss of some 3,800, could have been 38,000, but for the fact that they were not on board and not on duty. Second, while the targets were the ships, the targets should have been the repair yards, the dry docks, the maintenance facilities, to ensure that those ships that were in fact struck would not have been capable of being repaired. Three, the fuel, the fuel tanks, the fuel farm on the island made the difference between refueling there at Pearl Harbor or requiring the ships, if repaired, to be towed back to the United States for refueling. Those two locations and the absence of crew on board made all the difference in the world. And equally important was the absence of the U.S. Air ca aircraft carrier fleet both the Lexington and Enterprise. They were going to be part of the return to vindication. Admiral Isoruku Yamamoto was considered the mastermind of the Pearl Harbor attack. And while he, in fact, took on the responsibility for the attack, it was a reluctant responsibility because he commented that within the first six to 12 months, if the United States could not be defeated, Japan would in fact lose the war. On April 18th, 1943, while on an inspection flight to troops and forces in portions of the Northern Solomon Islands, a flight of P-38 Lightning aircraft were dispatched after being given information regarding the flight, attacked the aircraft, killing the Admiral. Japanese leadership at that point in time suffered a severe break. The difference for the balance of the war could not be minimized. Within two weeks of the Pearl Harbor raid, Washington made a decision to identify a need for a plan to respond to the Japanese attack. The consideration was given to find a way to attack the homeland. There were no long-range bombers available, nor bases close enough to Japan to affect that raid. A decision was made jointly between the Navy and the Army Air Corps to launch Army bombers off of aircraft carrier. The leadership of the project for the flight rested with a Lieutenant Colonel James Doolittle. Doolittle's reputation to that time was well known. 
He was a pilot. He was an engineer. He had knowledge of aircraft operations. He was available. The plan was to select a group of volunteers, 16 aircraft that would be launching from the USS Hornet with the intent of attacking targets in Japan, then flying on to bases in China where friendly forces would assist them in landing and then return to friendly territory. The date was April 18th. The fleet was to depart from Alameda Naval Air Station in California, meet up in the Hawaiian Island waters and move on towards Japan and launch the fleet within 400 miles of the Japanese homeland. Unfortunately, some 650 miles away from the homeland, Japanese patrol boats were spotted and fearing that notification would be sent, the boats were dispatched, but the flight was launched early. The 16 aircraft with a crew of 80, with five in each plane, launched with a minimum amount of equipment and a maximum amount of fuel, were to fly to the Japanese land with seven targets on the ground tar identified to drop some 2,000 pounds from each aircraft and then fly on to territory in China. Because of the early departure and weather that was encountered after leaving Tokyo, the aircraft unfortunately were unable to land safely except for one. The remaining 15 aircraft were either forced due to a lack of fuel to have the crew bail out over open water or over land in eastern China. The one aircraft that did land safely landed in the Soviet Union and due to the fact that the Soviet Union had a non-aggression pact with Japan, the five-member crew were held and not quickly released. The remaining 15 aircraft unable to land had 75 members saved. Unfortunately, three crew members bailing out died during the bailout. An additional eight were captured by the Japanese after bailing out, three of which were executed, one died of illness. The remaining four remained prisoners for the duration of the war. While the damage over Japanese homeland was minimal, the psychological impact was much greater, forcing the Japanese to withdraw some of their naval fleet to protect the homeland and changing their direction in terms of attacking American territory. Doolittle, thinking that because of the loss of all the aircraft would result in his being court-martialed upon returning back to the U.S., was greatly surprised when he was promoted and became the recipient of the Congressional Medal of Honor. The Doolittle Raid, while not a military achievement, nevertheless was considered a significant achievement and could very well have been a moment in time that changed the course of the war. The leadership of the military at the time had to be rested with a variety of sources in the Pacific area. Two individuals were chosen by the combined Joint Chiefs of Staff to lead forces in the Pacific. Admiral Chester Nimitz and General Douglas MacArthur. Nimitz was to be the Commander-in-Chief of all forces in the North, Central, and South Pacific, while MacArthur was going to be in charge of all Southwest Pacific Area forces. Nimitz additionally would be responsible for the entire Pacific fleet. By dividing leadership, 
The concern was coordination could be a problem. And while this did not prove insurmountable, it did pose additional challenges going forward. While there was coordination between Army and Navy forces, the Japanese, on the other hand, remained separate and distinct between their leadership. Army forces oftentimes would make decisions without coordinating with the Navy bases nearby, just as Navy operations would do the same thing. This posed a problem going forward and conceivably could have been an issue during some of the engagements with the United States. One of the first major engagements that took place between Japan and the U.S. dealt with an island chain north and west of the Hawaiian Islands. Commander Joseph J. Rochefort and Lieutenant Commander Edward T. Layton were part of a team that decoded Japanese transmissions in that area. Having successfully broken the Japanese military code, there was a belief that the code would reveal the next target. Commander Rochefort, believing he had identified the target, but yet not convinced of its particular location, sought to broadcast in the clear from the island in question an instruction that the island operation was experiencing problems with fresh water. By broadcasting this information and then monitoring the Japanese coded messages, it was believed that it would be revealing which island in fact was the island targeted. As it was discovered, the U.S. determined that when the Japanese next broadcast a message to their fleet in the Pacific, they revealed that the island of Midway was experiencing fresh water problems. And since that was the target, Island X in the Japanese coded message revealed to Rochford and his team that Midway was the target and the necessary information was communicated back to command to ensure that the U.S. fleet would be waiting for the Japanese when they attacked. The Japanese fleet did in fact target Midway and between June 4th and June 7th of 1942 the U.S. carrier fleet was waiting for them. With patrol aircraft being sent out looking to identify the carrier as well as the support fleet, the PBY Catalina was the excellent aircraft at the time and used and did identify the fleet. The engagement between the U.S. and the Japanese targets was the first time in the history of warfare that carrier aircraft were the only ones to see the receptive ships that no two carriers saw each other but the aircraft from the respective carriers did. The engagement between the US and the Japanese resulted in four of the Japanese carriers sunk, three of which had participated in the Hawaiian raid. 292 aircraft were lost by the Japanese and a total of 2,500 casualties were suffered. The U.S. lost one carrier, the Yorktown, one destroyer, the USS Hamnan, 145 aircraft, and some 300 casualties. However, the loss of two-thirds of the Japanese carrier force was an indication to the Americans, as well as to the Japanese leadership, that the course of the war going forward had already been determined. And in fact, the cessation of hostilities in the future and the victor was already known. In addition to the military efforts to defeat the Empire of Japan during the Second World War, there was another lesser known effort on the part of the US government. This effort actually started in 1938 when scientists who had been working with the German government 
were part of an effort to discover the capability of harnessing the atom. German scientists back in 1938 discovered nuclear fission. What this meant is that Germany was on a road to possibly discovering the ability to build an atomic bomb. These same scientists realizing not only the significance of a bomb's development, but the militancy of the German government felt that they could no longer be party to this development. And beginning in the mid-30s through the late 30s, they gradually found methods to leave Germany and portions of Europe and travel to England and the United States. By 1939, a group of American scientists along with these physicists, metallurgists, and other members of the scientific community that came from Europe met and discussed Germany's efforts to develop the bomb and the need for the United States to embark on their own project and to prevent Germany from moving forward. One of the physicists met with Albert Einstein, a known physicist in the United States, who also had previously emigrated from Germany. And with Einstein's efforts, wrote a letter to President Roosevelt discussing the need for bomb development. With Einstein's assistance, an advisory committee was created in October of 1939. Shortly after Germany began World War II, officially. Progress started slowly at one of the research sites at Columbia University in New York. As progress developed, other sites throughout the country needed to be created to move beyond the theoretical into the practical the University of Chicago, Oak Ridge, Tennessee in 1942, Hanford, Washington in 1943. Each one of these sites were selected to build the reactors to extract the necessary material for bomb development. In June of 1942, The name of the project was settled on. The office at Columbia University in Manhattan was in an area known as the Manhattan Engineering District. The decision was made that the project would be called the Manhattan Project. In September of 1942, General Leslie Groves was selected as the project he lead and put in charge of the logistics, the facilities, the supplies, the personnel. Additionally, J. Robert Oppenheimer, a known physicist who had already been working on theor theoretical approaches to nuclear energy was selected to lead the bomb's development. He is considered the father of the atomic J. Robert Oppenheimer was selected as the technical leadership, considered to be the father of the atomic bomb. In April of 1943, it was necessary to relocate the operational design to a central area safely away from populated buildup to enable for possible testing of a device. That area was Alamogordo, New Mexico in the central New Mexico desert. Scientists working under Oppenheimer were capable and successful 
in their development. The formulations that were used for testing were settled on. The creation of the device was settled on. And in fact, on July 16, 1945, the first nuclear reaction was detonated from a tower standing some 100 feet above the sands of Alamogordo, New Mexico. It was called the Trinity Test. The device was called the Gadget. A 22 kiloton device was detonated. The fireball created by that device could be seen some 180 miles away. The crew of researchers, military personnel, support personnel, were some six miles away from the blast site and felt the shock wave 40 seconds after the detonation. The heat from that first detonation took the sand surrounding the tower and turned it into glass. And that glass, later known as trinitite, was slightly radioactive. The decision at that time on the 16th of July was to notify the Japanese that failure to surrender would result in untoward destruction to the Japanese homeland. They did not respond. For the bomb to be transported to a location in the Pacific, it was necessary to properly and safely compartmentalize the components. It was decided that the bombs that were being developed, two, were created. The first one, to be known as Little Boy, was a 15 kiloton uranium-based device. The second one, to be known as Fat Man, was a 21-ton plutonium-based device. Fat Man and the gadget that was tested at the Alamogordo site were the same construction in terms of technology. The plutonium device was earlier selected to ensure that because of its complexity they wanted to test it out to ensure that it would detonate successfully. Once it was determined that the device could be detonated properly, both of these bombs were constructed and then transported by a number of different methods. The inert parts of Little Boy were moved by the USS Indianapolis, a cruiser, successfully brought to the island of Tinian in the Pacific, where they would be assembled and loaded onto an aircraft selected. The aircraft selected was called the Enola Gay. The target assembly also of Little Boy was also transported, but instead of by ship, was transported by aircraft. Fat Man, the second bomb to be dropped, was also transported by air, along with the balance of its components. The aircraft arrived ten days after they left the United States. Communication with the Japanese government 
to surrender unconditionally was rejected. The decision was made by the President of the United States, Harry S. Truman, after the death of President Roosevelt to drop a device on a city that was selected because of its military significance. The city was Hiroshima. Little Boy was to be detonated over Hiroshima on August 6, 1945. The bomb was dropped and at 8.15 a.m. on the morning of August 6th, it detonated. The casualty count for that drop was between 90 and 140,000 personnel who subsequently suffered the effects of radiation fallout. Notification was sent to Japanese leadership after the bomb detonated to surrender unconditionally. Japan refused. Military leadership convinced the emperor and other members of the government the United States only had one bomb. We could still defend the homeland and we could still win. With the decision not to surrender, a second device was detonated over the city of Nagasaki on August 9th at 11.02 a.m. The casualties of that detonation were between 60 and 80,000. It should be pointed out that the decision to detonate the second bomb only occurred because Japan refused to surrender. On August 15th, the Emperor of Japan, for the first time in the history of the Japanese nation, broadcast on radio to the nation that the decision to surrender was final. Unconditional surrender was accepted. However, the Allies agreed that the emperor was going to be allowed to remain in power and did so. On September 2nd, 1945, on the deck of the USS Missouri, a battleship in Tokyo Harbor, the terms of surrender were signed by the Allies and her forces against the Empire of Japan. That day, that time, represented the effective end of the Second World War. September 2nd, 1945 marks a date in time that was the beginning of a new era. The global events known as World War II officially ended. When the signatures were affixed to the surrender documents, it was hoped that the future would be one of a new day, a new era, a new opportunity. The darkness that the world suffered for the previous six years was over. We were looking forward with hope and aspiration for the development of the future, not only for the United States, but for the rest of the world. For the 400,000 Americans who died, for the 670 plus thousand who were wounded, for the 72,000 who could not be identified and did not come home, for them the legacy was the future needs to be positive. We need to look forward with hope, looking forward for a new day. In reflecting back on the past 75 years, we've had opportunities for peace, 
We've had opportunities for success, but it has still been a challenge for the world at large still needs to learn how to get along. Tomorrow is a hope. Yesterday is a memory. Today is a beginning. Thank you for joining us.